<laughs> and what is your name, sir? Oh, I'm Tommy Chong. I've been smoking weed since I was 17 years old. Changed my life forever. From the war on drugs to legalization, Tommy Chong has been on the forefront of America's changing attitudes toward marijuana. He's even had a first-hand look at how the judicial system treats cannabis offenses during his stint in prison for a weed-related conviction. But let's rewind a little and start from the beginning. Marijuana. The burning weed with its roots in hell. You want to try some? No, thanks. I was scared of it, to tell you the truth. Maybe you're just a little too scared. My mother would talk about, you know, the, she was like, about some guy got high, got high on that marijuana and he killed his um, family with an ax. Murder. Suicide. The idea that marijuana caused really terrible effects, particularly madness and violence, became very common in the U.S. This idea that, you know, you'll do marijuana and it will make you crazy and, and it'll lead you to crime or, you know, lead you to have an out-of-body experience. Few people had first-hand experience with marijuana, yet overblown stories about its normal side effects were commonplace. Cannabis does have psychotomimetic effects, so that is people can experience, you know, panic attacks or anxiety when they take high doses of cannabis. Back in the day, the fear of marijuana was that it opened your mind. It started in, in the 60s with, with Bob Dylan, actually. Mr. Tambourine Man. Then take me disappearing through the smoke rings of my Of course, there's those famous um, film uh, shots from newsreels of a soldier smoking marijuana through, you know, the barrels of guns and that kind of thing in Vietnam. Many believe that cannabis use during the Vietnam War was how marijuana started to become more mainstream in the United States. That's why you got your anti-war protesters. They'd smoke a joint and say, "This war, this war sucks, man. You know, they're killing us for what? Why? Why are we over there?" America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. So for Nixon, um, the connection between marijuana and the Vietnam War was seen as a kind of almost anti-American or, or subversive uh, connection. And, um, and that, in many ways, inspired him to uh, escalate the war on drugs in the early 1970s. In launching the war on drugs, Nixon founded today's Drug Enforcement Agency, introduced no-knock warrants, and enacted the Controlled Substances Act, which lists marijuana in the Schedule One category of drugs, alongside methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. President Nixon said that drug abuse is public enemy number one, that drugs have unpredictable effects um, on your psyche that can lead to lasting damage. More Americans than not have experimented with drug use and many have experimented with marijuana. And a lot of us can say that what we were educated to fear didn't translate into the reality of what we experienced. We were trying to determine how you'd describe your brand of humor. How would you describe it? Uh, funny. <laughs> pot, pot humor. Part humor and part... part... Part humor or pot humor? Part pot humor. It was powerful, as far as I know. I mean, it just changed my life. And all I know was that when I heard music, I heard music. Cheech and I both consciously made sure that we were in good shape so they, that they would look at us and say, that's a stoner? You know, he's healthy. Then when I came down to L.A., because one of the reasons I came to L.A. was to work out at Gold's Gym. <laughs> that was our dream. Uh, they get stoned and they would go to these all-you-can-eat uh, buffets. And after they were there the first time, the second time the, the owner would come, no, no, we close, we close. <laughs> Up in Smoke changed so many lives. They're Cheech and Chong, the comedy team that gave birth to rock comedy and in the process turned on a whole generation. It was like, whoa, where have you guys been all our lives? <laughs> we invented the watch out drug use warning in, in the <laughs> for the motion picture industry.
And by next year, our spending for drug law enforcement will have more than tripled from its 1981 levels. Ronald Reagan declared he would double down on Nixon's war on drugs. Marijuana was such a symbol of the 60s and of the left and of the counterculture. You know, when Reagan, uh, the Reagan administration comes into power in the 1980s, there's kind of a pushback against really all things associated with the 60s. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. If you tell people to just say no, when they say yes, they have no information to go off of. They have no tools for staying safe. Go! Or else! This is your brain on drugs. Many advocates today believe Reagan's law enforcement driven fight against drugs led to skyrocketing incarceration rates, especially among marginalized communities. The war on drugs was actually much more pervasive than that. When you think about, uh, you know, how it impacted housing policies, people have been kicked out of their government housing, black and brown men, you know, taken away from their homes and uh, kids being raised without fathers. You can't get student loans uh, to, to be able to go to college to reinvest in yourself so that you can go and, and become a, a tax paying contributing member of society to your, uh, your community. So the tax spaces in our communities has disappeared. Thus, there's no money to rebuild, you know, uh, roads and schools. I think if anything, you know, the drug war and the ripple effects of the drug war only lay bare some of the real structural and racial inequalities in this country. It's a medicine. It's a medicine for our mind. It, 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 it allows us to think of how we can do these things, these great things. You know, people's opinions have changed pretty dramatically recently. And I think part of that is also due to the amazing research that we've seen in recent years, really documenting and tracking the medical use of, of marijuana. You know, um, the evidence has become pretty clear in its use for, you know, various like conditions such as glaucoma, for spasticity, wasting syndrome associated with HIV, uh, you know, HIV AIDS diagnoses. And we've also seen, you know, some really promising results when it comes to pain. The rise of uh, medical marijuana is that really drove um, this, this shift into, uh, into this new era that we have now. There was a guy in there doing what, 14 years? He was a dealer, you know, a pot dealer, a grower, a bunch of growers. The harms of this punitive approach to the war on drugs were becoming really, really obvious. In 2000, Human Rights Watch reported that African Americans were 13 to 57 times more likely to be incarcerated for drug crimes than their white counterparts. Black people are now still more than three times more likely to be arrested for weed offenses, even in states where marijuana is legal or decriminalized. Our communities have seen, uh, unfortunately, too many jail cells uh, because of this particular plant. Tommy spent this period of his life away from any weed. I never smoked for three years. You know, pre-trial pre probation, jail time, and then post-trial post-jail time probation. I wanted to prove to the government, to the world, that marijuana, cannabis, is not addicting. And so I quit with no problem. Today, less than 20 years after Tommy's imprisonment, lawmakers, including President Joe Biden, have been in talks about federal marijuana decriminalization and legalization. Decriminalize marijuana and automatically expunge prior marijuana convictions. I'm not the least bit bitter about it because I see the natural progression. Oh, it's a step in the right direction for sure. Well, when they legalized it in, uh, Dem in Colorado, I was there and uh, the day it was legalized and the lineup to get in the, in, in the, in the pot shop it looked like a lineup to see Jesus. It was a lineup. People that need it. The people that need pot shots. The Comprehensive Marijuana Reform Bill to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level and to address past injustices with respect to marijuana laws.
So one of the things that we at the Drug Policy Alliance are trying to do is building racial equity into it from the beginning. You know, saying that um, if you are going to collect revenues from a legalized market, some of those tax revenues have to be earmarked for communities most impacted, right? Allow for communities to apply for grants, to open parks in their communities, after school programs, job training programs. And we also really need to think when we create an industry, how do we make sure to set aside uh, licenses and opportunities for communities of color and low income people and people who've already been incarcerated to get into the industry. We need the, this type of economic uh, you know, benefit and development to go into our communities, to do exactly what I said before, to rebuild that infrastructure in our communities that has been failing as a, in part as a result of the war on drugs. Experts hope that as marijuana becomes less taboo and more accepted in our society, a more holistic conversation can be had around its usage. We can begin talking about marijuana and other drugs too, I hope, in a more honest way. So no longer having to argue that either marijuana is totally harmless or that it causes horrible effects in all its users, but rather recognize that all drugs can be good and bad. We already as a society use a number of mood altering substances every day. We use caffeine to start off our days. We use alcohol to take the edge off of a long week. Um, you know, many of us smoke a cigarette first thing in the morning or, you know, when we need a, a break in the middle of the day. The vast majority of people who use any of these substances do so in ways that do not disrupt their lives. The vast majority of people who use any drug do not develop a problem and do not have any impairment in their day-to-day -day lives. But there's going to be a small percentage of people who sometimes will develop problems because of their use, right? And how do we as a society um, not push them to the margins, but welcome them in and offer them tools and resources to stay safe rather than shunning them or locking them up or um, in some way uh, deeming them as abnormal when um, perhaps they just need some extra help and support. That's the kind of world that I would like to live in.